Okay, so real quick, I want to do one last video going over variables, and this one's just going to be detailing some high-level math and looking into a few libraries and a few different variances of things that we can do. So it's it's very low-level stuff that we can't really fit into its own specific, say, chapter or anything. So we're going to tie it here, and honestly, it's pretty good to be learned here at the very, very beginning because we can use it later on for quite a few things. Anyway, I'll stop rambling. Let's go and take a look. So again, it's just variable math. It's just gonna be a little bit more advanced mathematics and some different things that we can do. So, like always, I'm just gonna start the reserve keywords just because it's going to have a decent reference on what they are. So, what to do? Understanding numbers. There's gonna be two different types of number systems we're looking at. First one is going to be basic decimal system, also known as base 10. But this is also known as decimal number system because we have essentially digits ranging between 0 and 9. These are the ones that we are familiar with day to day as humans because that's just how we have learned. That's how we have created the world for centuries at this point. It'd be very difficult to completely rework your understanding of mathematics based on a different number system whether that be hexadecimal octal binary etc so if we look at this value 212 we use positional notation and kind of break this down to what we really have how this works is 2 times 10 to the 0 plus 1 times 10 to the 1 plus two times 10 to the two, because we look at it, we have 212, two, one, two. This is in the zero position, this is in the first position, second position. So this is the least significant value. This is the most significant value. That, oh, that's a W, my bad. So you might also hear me say least significant bit, most significant bit, you'll understand why in a second. But basically, Changing this value from say 212 to 213, that's not a big difference. So changing this one around, this has the least significant impact on the numbers. One good way to remember that this is the least significant one. And for most significant, if I change this from 212 to 3, well that's a magnitude of 100 at this point, so we're not back to, but a difference of 100. So essentially this has the most significant impact if I change this. But regardless, we have a position, so 10 to the 0, 10 to the 1, and then 10 to the 2. So if I do 2 times 10 to the 0, well, 10 to the 0 is 1, that gives me 2. And then if I do, I'm just going to leave this here. 10 to the 1, that's 10 times 1, gives me 10, so 10 plus 2. And then 10 to the 2. I mean, 100 times 2, which is 200. So 200 plus 10 plus 2 gives me 212. So if you have any super long number that goes well beyond, like, beyond multiple quintillion or something like that, it's going to exceed what your computer can actually process. And if you needed to actually represent that number, you'd have to break that down to a string. And if you wanted to actually like look at the inner workings of it, you can break it down to positional notation. And then you'd be able to do some work with it at that point. But I digress. Moving on, we have binary. Also known as base two. Binary, instead of having a range of zero through nine, now has a range of zero and one. So if we look at this 1101, one, one, we do the same thing, position notation. So we have a 1 in the 0 position, a 0 in the first position, 1 in the second and the third. I do 2 to the 0 because I have base 2. So 1 times 2 to the 0 is going to be 1 times 1, which is going to be 1. Then I have 0 times 2 to the 1 is 2, 2 to the times 2 is going to be 0. Then 2 to the 2 is 4, 1 times 4 is 4, 2 to the 3 is 8, and we have 8, so if I do 8 plus 4 plus 0 plus 1, I get 13, and 1101 is 13 in binary. 
this is one way you can do binary to decimal conversions. Now, why are we talking about binary? Why do we care? Well, we care for different reasons, but I'll touch on that in just a second. So, unsigned data is going to be strictly non-negative values. To find the maximum range of unsigned data values, or data types, simply raise two to the power of the data type's bit size. You note know that right here, right? Okay, so we have eight bits. What's a bit? A one or a zero, also known as binary values. So if we have, I don't know, a size of four, that means I can have values between all zeros which would be zero, and then all ones. Well, what's the, what's the maximum size? Well, I mean, two to the four. And then that gives me a solid 16. Now, I should do Minus one is the largest. Oh, okay, it's not range here because the thing is, we count at zero, so we're gonna do minus one to the four. This would be 15. So we have 16 values to work with, zero through 15. So if you want the highest number you can actually use, two to the bit size minus one. So since we have four here, my highest one is two to the four for my range, subtract one, and that's the highest number I can get, which would be one, 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 one in binary. Now, we don't really care about four bits here. We care about is the lowest one because this is the only one I'm gonna write out. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So this is the lowest binary value I can have, which again, all zeros is zero, but then eight ones. What's this? Well, if I go to the eight, that is equal to 256. The value should be the highest value you can get, 256 minus one, which is 255. Now, what I'm looking at, I am looking at an unsigned char. So my range is zero to 255. And if you recall, that is the number of ASCII values that we can have. And the reason why we can only have 0 to 255 for ASCII is because that is what the character data type is limited to. That's the supported number range it can have, 0 through 255. So when we look at this, a short, which we haven't touched on yet, we have shorts and longs. So I get says a short is going to be less than a long by magnitude of two, basically. So 16 times two would be 32, so it's gonna be twice as large. In terms of how many bits it can support, so we have 16 bits and 32 bits. So the thing is, uh, that's not like two times. That's gonna be two times the number of bits is ranging from 6, 65,535 to 4,294,965,295. So, shorts. Highest value, 65,535. Again, that would be two to the 16 minus one. Gives us this value right here. And then for longs, we have two to the 32, which is gonna be this very large number plus one. So that's kind of how it works. So that's why I care about binary because everything in our computer is made up in bits. So, that's why I said earlier, when it comes to floats and doubles, floats are technically smaller in size than a double. So it's more efficient to use them. So if you knew you were working with very small data, you could guarantee, without a shadow of doubt, you're working with something less than 65,536. And it had to be non-negative you could use an unsigned short because you're only working with data between zero and 65,505. That would give you 16 bits in memory. Now, 16 bits is not a lot, but if you're dealing with an insane amount of number, like millions to billions, 
of different values at a time that'll add up so you would be using twice as many bits if you stored everything in a long for example or maybe an integer because it's also 32 bits so you see long has the same range as our unsigned integers even though integers are a little bit different you see the minimum size is 16 bits it's specific on hardware the reason we use integers so much instead of shorts and longs they're easier to use and the compiler will do optimization a lot of the time to interchange things a lot of the time then you see something else here we have a long long now the short long long longs and all that they have static sizes they are not going to change so you see the minimum size is 16 the size is 16 for short the long is 32 so long long is 64. This is the largest value you can store on your CPU in a long long. Because our CPUs in consumer grade is 64 bits most of the time. If your CPU for whatever reason is lower, like a 32 bit processor or something like that, you're not getting this value because you cannot support 64 bits. You would be able, you'd be locked here in 32 bits. So understanding how binary works can help a lot when it comes to understanding the ranges of data that you can work with at data type level. So you have a character or a char, you have eight bits to work with. You can only go up to 255. Short, you have 16 bits. You can go to 65,055 and so on and so forth. Now, my notes on unsigned here, it's always starting at zero, always. What if I wanna do negative values? Well, you use what is called signed data, and most of it, this is the default. Most of the time we default to signed data. But essentially, when it comes to integer data types, signed data takes half of the maximum range of bits and shifts it into the negative values. So you're gonna notice something. So you remember characters went zero through 255. But a signed character still has eight bits. But now we're ranging from 128 to positive 127. So we've taken half of it and shifted it over into the negative. So if we do 255 divided by 2, we get, well, we do 256 because that's a range we're working with. Then we get negative 128 divided by negative 2. Now the reason is like, well, why is it negative 128 to 127? We have to account for zero. So you're going to have one less on every positive value so that is why there's a discrepancy there so same thing here with shorts instead of getting 65,535 we get half of that into the negative values and the other half in positive values or non-negative values because you have to count for zero same thing long one half goes negative other half is non-negative and same thing for every single specifically integer style type so that's characters shorts longs integers because when we do a floating type it's much more complicated because of how they handle their floating data and matisse bits and stuff like that and we're not going to touch on that right now just because it's it's a bit more than what's necessary so understanding binary helps a lot with understanding the range of what your data types can work with and understanding the difference between signed and unsigned also helps a lot. Now, the reason why we have half is because let's take a look. Let's say, let's say I have a data type that is four bits. So characters, eight bits. I have something that's four bits, right? Well, by default, we already looked at it. So we have zero, zero, zero through one, 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 okay? If I look at this, I have 2 to the n, with n being the number of bits I have, so I have 2 to the 4. I've got a range of 16. And I can have 0 through 2 to the 4 minus 1, which is going to be 15. But these are the values I have to work with, 0 through 15. Alright? Well, whenever I want to do sine data, I use the first bit as a parity bit. What that means is it determines is it negative or is it non-negative, right? 
So essentially, I am losing a little bit of my range, because now I only have three bits to work with, because one is dedicated to determining, hey, is this negative, or is it not negative? So now, instead of having two to the four minus one, my highest value, so I have two to the four minus one as the exponent, minus one, it's now two to the three minus one, which only gives me seven. Same thing if I'm dealing with eight, so my character, Unsigned, I have to 8 minus 1, 255. Meanwhile, if I have 2 to the 8 minus 1, minus 1, that gives me 2 to the 7, 128 minus 1, 127. Highest value I get, right there, 127. And then, for the lower range, I do negative 2. A minus one, basically. I don't do the minus one because I count for zero. But regardless, that is how we can determine the range of data that we have to work with. Now, moving on, we have the result of what happens if you exceed that range. So that is what we call it overflow. And we're only going to about integer overflow. We're not going to do a floating point or anything like that because it gets, again, it gets weird. So, now we've seen the maximum range, what happens if we go beyond it? Well, first, if you try to compile it, your compiler is usually going to throw a warning saying, hey, you're doing the wrong, if you have like, say, whenever I do this, right here on the right where you send this code, it is going to treat this as a log. It is immediately going to say this value, which is, this is the highest number for an integer, I'm adding one to it, so it's going to go beyond it by one, and it's automatically going to say that this result is a long. And I'm trying to store it in an integer data type. What's going to happen is it's, it's going to work, but instead of getting uh, eight here, I don't know exactly what this thing is to two billion one hundred forty-seven million four hundred eighty-three thousand six hundred forty-seven. But instead of getting six hundred forty-eight. I'm going to get negative 2,147,483,648 because I have gone overflow and wrap all the way back around to the lowest value and go. And we're going to start counting up negatives. Same thing happens on the other hand. So if I go beyond the lower limit, so this is negative 2,147,483,648, minus one, instead of getting 6.9, I get 2,147,483,647, the highest value. So I went beyond the lower limit and wrapped back around to the highest value. So again, just be very careful when you're dealing with data types, understand what kind of sizes you can work with, what data you can work with. If you need to adjust the data type, then you need to do that. And that moves to our next topic of type conversions. Now, a lot of times this can happen automatically, just like previously, whenever I exceeded the data type, when I was doing a literal, doing that highest value plus one, it automatically converted it to a long. Now, same thing happens when you mix integers and floating point data, then you need to keep track of any of those conversions that might happen. So during arithmetic operations, if either operand is a floating point, then an implicit conversion will happen resulting in a floating point result. So basically what's going to happen is if I do 5 times 3 point, I'm just going to do this. I'm not doing 5, I'm doing 2. Plus 3.5. I'm going to get 7.0 is a result. It's not going to try and typecast it to an integer. It's going to give me a floating point result. And that is important whenever it comes down to division a lot of time, because sometimes we need to manually intervene to alter the data type to what we really want it to be. So let's take this 
typecasting is what we're doing. So forcing one data type to another. So we have an example here. We have two variables, variable one, variable two, variable one is 50, variable two is seven. So I have two different divisions going on here. I have result one and result two. Result one is just a var one divided by var two being stored in a double. Okay. So I'm dividing two integers, even though I'm using a double data type and everything. Whenever I divide these, I get seven. Now I get 7.000000 because the result resulting variable is being stored in a double. However, while this operation is happening, it's still an integer. It's not gonna give me the floating precision that I'm wanting. So what I have to do is the second one, result two, which does typecast of double var one divided by double var two. So whenever I do this parentheses double here, this is typecasting var one to a double type var2 to a double type, doing floating point division, storing that in a floating point result, and then I get 7.142857, which is the actual answer I would want here. So this is when it comes to a point where you can't always rely on implicit conversions working for you. You have to be 100% sure that you don't need to manually typecast something. So you just have to keep an eye on things if you start mixing data types and specifically mixing integers and floating point or make sure that if you need to use a larger data type like a long or a long for an integer or a double for a float you need to make sure that you're using those properly so you don't overflow so just keep in mind what your data is that's the most important part of programming is keeping track and maintaining your data 100%. Now, let's move on to some fancier math function stuff. So I've done everything kind of by scratch so far. I missed a angle bracket here in my bad. So we have a standard math library in C that has access to several math functions and a few constants so we can fully take advantage of. Again, this is going to be an actual working link if you want to actually use it feel free to do so uh, the actual slides and pdfs are handed out to you actually taking the course if you're watching the video i'll have it linked in the description so first thing we do for this i'm actually just including a whole working program here we include our standard input output because we're printing we have math.h because we want to do some math functions and i have a single double variable set to eight and do three operations print LF because I'm printing a double. Power, or just POW, var 1, 2. So what's happening here is I'm doing exponent. So I'm raising 8, var 1, to the second power. So I should get 64, my result. Second one is going to be square root, var 1. So I'm just getting the square root of my variable, which is 8. So square root of 8 is 2.828427. And the last one is I am just printing out this m underscore pi this is a constant that i'm pulling from the math library itself so whenever i pull that i get 3.141593 which is our math constant so just i want to do a brief showing of this is a very common library to use because these types of operations don't exist so if i wanted to raise eight to the seventh power i would do pow var one seven if I wanted to use mpy for anything else, I can just pull it in anytime I wanted to. Same thing, square root. So I can use these functions at any time, the moment that I include math.h. Next, we're going to look at random numbers, which honestly have a lot more use than most people would understand or expect. But we occasionally need to use them. So we can take advantage by the C standard library, which is the standards sedlib.h again link and I'll add, add that to the description as well so we include sedio.h because we are printing and we are doing sedlib because we are using the rand function so we have is two random numbers 
int var one equals ran parentheses calling the function, int var two equals ran parentheses calling the function basically. And then I'm just printing those. And I get uh, whatever this is. 1,804,289,383. And then I get 846,930. No, eight. Yeah, 846. Wait, this is 1,804,000,000. Million, okay. 846,930,886. My bad. Got my comma up here and was reading it. My bad. And that's cool. I got two very large random numbers. But a lot of the time, if we're doing random numbers, we don't we don't want something that large. We want to limit the actual scope and the actual range of it. So how do we do that? Well, good old modulo. Limit the amount of the actual results, and then we can adjust the lower limit using some basic addition. So same thing as being included. Then we want a random number scope of zero through 50. So int var one equals rand modulo 50. So it's going to always give us a result of zero excuse me, through 49. And this should have been 49. Body rest. So when we do this, print f for sent d bar one, I get I got 33 for my random number. But essentially, we are limiting the scope and the amount of actual variables we're working with. This should be, I got my values off, so 50 through 100. Then I do int var 2 and module 50, so I'm still getting 50 results. 0 through 49 right here. This should be 99, my bad. I got my results off by 1, and this should be 49. Now add 50 to it, giving us 50 through 99 for the second one. And now I'll get 86. So we can adjust our range by doing stuff like that. Not too bad. But it gives us a lot more control over our actual data. Next is going to be a C. So Random numbers are not actually truly random on any system. They are determined beforehand by what is known as a seed, and we can con freely control what the seed is to some degree. Now, the default for a seed is always going to be set to one, and then we can manually adjust that by using some different integer. Now, why do we care about this? So, before I actually answer the question, let's take a look at this code. Name includes, I'm doing printf rand, and then I'm doing srand59. So I'm changing the seed to 59, and I'm doing rand again. And I change the seed to 7, and I do rand. And all of a sudden, I've got 1, I think it's 1 billion, 1 billion, 804 million, 289,283. Then I get 272,000, no, yeah, 272,081,135, and then I get 1,045,618,657. So I got three random numbers, right? And I, I changed my seed every single time. I should always get random numbers, right? Mm, not really. So if you recall, C is a compiled language. Now, changing if we do rand at any time, like in the previous ones, we're going to get random numbers. Every single time we do rand, it'll be something that's random. And then if I change s rand to something else, I get a different seed, so I should get still a different random number. There is a problem, though. No matter what I do, if I'm using the same seed in the same way, and C is a compiled language, every time when I compile it, I have set the seed at that moment. It will not change. So if I run any of my previous programs or this one, I am always going to get these results. It is not going to change. So that's what I mean by it. it's not truly random. 
So, yes, it is a random number, technically. I mean, I didn't pull any of these numbers from anything. It did generate it randomly, but it's repeatable. That's what it means by it's not truly random. Now, we'll get back to that in a second. But first, we look at time. You can use it into the library if we want to get the actual time in our program. And time is not going to be like looking at the hour or clock or anything like that. It's going to be how time is actually handled. So include time at H, again, link, description. So the time that we'll be getting is what is known as epoch time. You may have heard this called Unix time as well, especially if you've been doing programming for a while. And what that is, is the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. Now, this is the date that determines every digital clock for the most part. I think there are some that use a different value, but for the most part, when we look at any timestamp or anything like that, like a system running clock right now on your phone, on your GPS, especially your GPS, it is using epoch time. And you can very easily get epoch time by doing this right here. We'll touch on that in a second. But it is constantly changing. Now, if you're keen on a lot of things, then you see that this is an ever-growing number. It is counting the number of seconds since this date. And it's storing it in a data type on your system. And there is an issue there, the fact that it is continuously getting larger and larger and larger. And eventually, yes, it will overflow. And that is guaranteed to happen and I, I forget the exact date, but it's 2038. So in some time we have basically the equivalent of Y2K um, in 2038. So maybe 2038 problem if you've ever heard of it. Uh, a lot, I learned that some people call it the apocalypse, and I, I think that's honestly pretty clever, but there is an issue there. So that time that this date may be adjusted eventually, I don't know. A lot of things are going to happen around 2038 regarding this particular aspect. But for now, it's fine. It works. It's functional. Let's talk about it. So, we include sci.h because we're printing. We include time.h because we want the time. And so we look at this. We have int epoch seconds equals typecasted int time zero. So this is going to give me the actual epoch in seconds and we can typecast it to an integer just because i want to work with integers not a big deal and then i do epoch minutes equals the seconds divided by 60 because there's 60 minutes in a set uh, there's 60 seconds in a minute epoch hours minutes divided by 60 there's 60 minutes in an hour and then days equals epoch hours divided by 24 and there's 24 hours in a day and then i have int w equals epoch days divided by seven because there are seven days in a week this can be the number of week, the number of weeks since the epoch, at least January 1st, 1970. And then I have int d equals epoch days modulo 7. So I'm getting the remaining days since then. And I'm doing modulus because I, I, I don't want to account for weeks because I already have weeks accounted for. Same thing with hours 24, don't want to count for days. So I just modules 24, minute 60, second 60, and now what I have, number of weeks, days, hours, minutes, and seconds, specifically since the epoch. So that's one way we can kind of adjust and manipulate time. But what's really useful about taking advantage of epoch is the fact that it is constantly changing every single second. So, time with a random seed. So since epoch time is always counting up, it is perfect as a means to create true, in quotes, random numbers. Now this still isn't technically random, because if you run your program fast enough, yes, it's going to use the exact same seed, it's going to be repeatable, but you're going to get much better results because it's not like you're going to run your program in a second. So, 
fine here. So if we do this, we do sci.h, sci.lib, and time.h. Now we have a print. We can get random numbers. We can get the actual time. I do srand of int time zero to get the epoch. I set my C random number generator to the actual epoch. And I print three random numbers. These three random numbers are going to be unique every single second. So once the epoch changes, new random numbers. Now the second changes, new random numbers. So this is actually truly repeatably random or non-repeatable. You can you can do this multiple times and it will be continue to be random. You will not repeat the numbers unless you just happen to get very unlucky. So again, this is just several things that I want to discuss and they're pretty helpful going forward especially understanding a bit more about modulo looking to different libraries we'll take advantage of a lot of libraries of course of just using c in general but there's just a lot of math that goes on in programming and so looking at some of this high level stuff before we start getting into the more programmatical semantics of things like branches and loops arrays different types of data structures and stuff like that so there's a lot there's a lot to go forward and this is still pretty basic but it gives a good view into what's to come now a lot of the things i discuss at the end are pretty niche and you might use them in the future you might not but i figure i'd cover them anyway just because they're pretty good honestly but i digress so that's it for variables we'll move on to i think branches is next that's it for now so as always if you learned something, I'll see you next video.